first of all, I mean, thank you to everybody who's uh, who have come out here today to watch and participate in this debate. Um, I just want to start by sort of talking about the uh, Duquesne Undergraduate Philosophy Society, uh, who are hosting this debate between Dr. Swindoll and Dr. Miller. So uh, we have we host these debates occasionally uh, over the semesters. Um, we've had some really great ones on God, on democracy, and uh, we also host weekly discussions on various philosophical topics, whatever are interesting us. So I'll put a link down in the chat at some point uh, that you can click on and visit and sign up for our email list if you're interested in joining the society. Uh, but I guess I want to start by uh, introducing both of our professors, both of the people who are participating here in this debate today. So both of them are professors in the philosophy department here at Duquesne. Uh, we're going to start with Dr. Uh, Miller, who will be arguing on the side of capitalism for this debate. Uh, he specializes in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, particularly Platonism, as well as Nietzsche and psychoanalysis. Uh, he's written numerous articles and books, including his most recent piece, uh, which was titled Speech, Truth, Power, uh, and which published back in August. He also hosted a podcast called The Living Wisdom Podcast, which offered an introduction to philosophy uh, through the Netflix series The Black Mirror. Uh, next, I want to introduce Dr. Swindoll who will be taking the side of socialism in this debate. And he is versed in continental philosophy, critical theory, Catholic philosophy, and regularly teaches courses on uh, these sub subjects as well as Marx, Husserl, and existentialism. Over the course of his career, he's written, he's published two books and countless journal, journal articles and book chapters. And this is the third time that he's uh, joining us to participate in a debate with Dr. Miller. And so we're really grateful to have him here today. Uh, so. In a moment here, we're going to proceed with the debate. Basically, it's going to operate pretty simply. Dr. Miller and Dr. Swindoll, starting with Dr. Miller, are going to each give an introductory statement, which I believe they both prepared in advance. Mm -hmm. um, and then we will proceed uh, to allow them both to address any contentions that will obviously inevitably uh, erupt from their statements. So uh, for this portion of the debate, I'm going to ask that people can keep their microphones muted. Uh, then after that, after probably uh, 45 minutes or whenever Dr. Miller and Dr. Swindoll feel that they've resolved whatever uh, conflicts or reached whatever impasse they uh, finally feel that they've reached, um, then we're going to start taking questions. So at that point, uh, I'll remind you whenever we get to this point, but I'm going to have people just say in the chat that either they have a question, at which point we'll call on them, or if you're not comfortable uh, asking the question yourself, uh, you can write it and I'll read it out for you. So. If Dr. Miller, if you would like to begin with giving your opening statement. Okay, thank you. So yes, I've prepared a statement. I wish I were able to speak spontaneously. Um, I've never been able to do that in this kind of setting. So I wrote something up and I think it, it won't take me longer than 20 minutes. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll be under 20 minutes. So please forgive me. Economics, like most intellectual inquiry, used to be considered a branch of philosophy. The term is ancient Greek, combining the words for household, oikos, and rule, nomos. It was the study of household management. This was a good skill to have if you were in charge of an estate, as Greek gentlemen were. Xenophon was a student of Socrates and wrote a whole book on the subject, the Economicus. That philosophers pioneered this study is no accident of intellectual history, for a household is a microcosm of a state, provoking many of the same questions. Philosophers have always had the deepest insights into statecraft. Whether you're managing a household or a state, you want to make it prosperous. But that is not your primary task. After all, if you could make your estate prosperous by degrading everyone in your household, this would be poor estate management. So too for the state. If your policies make your nation rich but servile, you have failed as a leader, as an economist in this broader sense. So economics is a philosophical field, properly speaking. It's a branch of ethics and political theory. And the main questions are the same, how to bring about the best life, and more fundamentally, what is the best life? Needless to say, these are not questions you'll find economists investigating nowadays. They myopically assume the goal of their field is prosperity alone. This is one reason why they have failed in their most basic tasks. For example, to predict the financial crisis of 2008. 
But if we were to compare capitalism and socialism on this one point, namely prosperity, capitalism would be the clear winner. Since its inception in the Italian Renaissance, through its acceleration in England during the 18th and 19th centuries, capitalism has created more wealth than any other economic system in history. Indeed, during the last 40 years alone, capitalism has lifted more people out of poverty than has any other system in all of human history. But that does not make it superior as a social system. For if it has done so by degrading people, it has made a devil's bargain. This, I believe, is the best objection against it, and I will address it eventually. First, though, it must be said, when it comes to degrading people, no system has done this more efficiently and on so great a scale as socialism. This is evident to any student of the 20th century, where socialism ruined every country in which it was tried. It brought poverty, tyranny, and death on the order of 100 million people to countries as diverse as those of the Soviet Union, to mention a few, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Eastern and Central Europe, again, just a few, East Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Asia, China, Vietnam, North Korea, Africa, Angola, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Latin America, Cuba, Chile, and Venezuela. That's a broad array of nations. So it's not as if the experiment wasn't tried in all sorts of different circumstances and it failed every time. Adherents of socialism, when they pierce through the fog of their theories and look at these facts, will say, but that wasn't real socialism. This is known as the no true Scotsman fallacy. Take any generalization about Scotsmen. For example, let's say I believe that they all love Robbie Burns. Whenever someone presents me with a Scotsman who doesn't love Robbie Burns, I could say, well, he's not a true Scotsman. This becomes more ridiculous the more often it is used. When it is used in every actual instance, it becomes contemptible. What's truly remarkable about the tragedy of socialism is that it was entirely predicted by Plato. In his Republic, he distinguishes five constitutions, ranking them from best to worst. The fourth best, or rather second worst, is democracy. Equality and freedom, when really pursued by a democratic government, lead to anarchy. Prisoners cannot be constrained, immigrants must be given equal status as the native born, and even domestic beasts should be accorded the respect of citizens. However, the stubborn persistence of wealth gaps between rich and poor requires some intervention. Let me just pause for a moment. Oh, I just want to make sure that you all are still there. I lost track. A demagogue, Greek for leader of the people, namely the poor, steps forward into this chaos and promises, a re and especially into the situation in which the, the gap between wealth and poor persists. And he promises a redistribution of wealth once he's elected. But this is possible only if he's awarded supreme power with a right to violence against the rich, because only once threatened will they surrender their wealth. The people are eager to give him, the, the demagogue, this power. But once he has attained it, his concern for the poor, whether or not it was genuine, becomes a concern for himself. Step by predictable step, the servant of the people becomes their master. So went the socialist revolutions in most of the countries already mentioned. But a decisive blow against socialism is not an argument in favor of capitalism, which is my task, unless they are the only two options. Well, are they? To answer that question, we need to define our terms. Socialism, as we've seen, is government control of the economy for the purpose of achieving equality, although in practice, it does so for the enrichment and empowerment of the leader and his class. As socialists put it, the state rather than the rich control the means of production. This is why it always leads to tyranny. With so much power concentrated in the government, those who lust for power are drawn to political office like flies to dung. Once they've acquired it, they can rationalize the most brutal policies as necessary evils to achieve the workers' paradise. Capitalism, by contrast, minimizes government control of the economy, allowing free markets in capital. But what exactly is a free market in capital? Capital is from the Latin caput, for head, as in head of cattle, a measure of wealth in medieval European economies. It came to mean a surplus of wealth, not the possessions or income that one needs to get by, but the extra wealth that one can invest in a company 
or loan to an individual, thereby gaining interest or a profit share if the venture succeeds. With strong biblical warrant, where this practice was called usury, there were medieval Christian prohibitions against doing this. After the power of capitalism for prosperity became clear, however, Jesuits helped reinterpret those passages so that usury came to mean not loaning at interest as such, but only those loans for which the interest rate was considered too high, as in nowadays pawn shops, payday loans, or predatory credit cards. In other words, capitalism, as the Venetians, the Dutch, and the English practiced it in the modern period, was thought by the medieval Christian church to degrade people. You get a sense of their thinking when you hear about someone who, say, buys water bottles and brings them to a disaster area, not to distribute them charitably, but to charge a price many times what he paid because the victims of the disaster are desperate. This actually happened, I mean, I'm sure it happens all the time, but I was in an area of North Carolina that suffered a hurricane and people were coming in and selling, at least one person who was on the news, came in and sold water bottles at extortionate rates. There's obviously something repellent about that. The medieval Christians disapproved of usury because they thought all loans were like that. They were wrong, even if they were onto something. Some loans are exploitative, those already mentioned and many others, including in some instances, student loans. But not all loans are usurious, at least in the Jesuitical sense. Some loans are wholesome and quite necessary for economic growth. Loaning at interest allows people who do not have capital, for example, to start businesses that, that would otherwise remain only in their dreams. By taking a risk with someone else's money, people with ideas and drive can create products, services, and jobs that can help not only themselves, but others as well. This is why capitalism is called dynamic. When it works well, money flows toward the people who can make the best use of it, rather than accumulating in a treasure chest where it is of use, if at all, only to the rich. In laissez-faire capitalism or libertarianism, the capitalists or rich can trade their wealth however they wish without any government interference. While this does permit money to flow freely at first, it can also lead to capitalism's worst problems. Capitalists without any regard for workers' safety, the environment, or anything that inhibits profit may degrade their fellow citizens and their neighborhood without penalty. They can exploit the poor with usury, as we have seen, but they can also establish markets in vice, in human body parts and slaves, for instance, or harmful and addictive drugs. Human nature being what it is, for any product and service you can imagine, no matter how degrading, there is always some appetite for it, so that in laissez-faire capitalism, there will be someone willing to sell it for a profit. The immediate tyranny of the socialist demagogue thus finds its double in the slow but equally inevitable tyranny of oligarchs under capitalism. These will be the capitalists unscrupulous enough to put profit above everything else. It is no more realistic to expect virtue to restrain them than it is to expect virtue to keep the demagogue from becoming a Lenin, a Stalin, a Mao, or a Pol Pot. The fantasies of libertarianism and socialism are thus two sides of the same coin. The dream, the virtue, will forestall the inevitable slide. But even if the libertarian fantasy were to come true and the capitalists limited their investments to wholesome goods and services, monopolies inevitably form, ending the competition among investors and innovators that is essential to the dynamism that makes capitalism appealing. The age of robber baron capitalism, the second half of the 19th century, made all of these problems clear. In Pittsburgh, maybe primarily, the degradation was evident to everyone. Frick, Mellon, and Carnegie lived in distant mansions while immigrant laborers lived and worked in squalor along the Mon. Socialism, or at least the version developed by Marx, was a response to the same problem in England and Germany. The solution, expropriate the capitalists, put the state in charge of production, and aim the state toward perfect equality by making it accountable to the people. Yet the cure turned out to be worse than the disease. Well, what else could be done? Americans applied a number of small remedies to minimize the problems without trying to solve them all with one stroke. Unions and collective bargaining gave workers power in their negotiations with the bosses. 
dulling the edge of the worst workplace degradation. Duquesne University was founded by missionary priests who saw that the children of factory workers could escape the cycle of exploitation only if they had a professional skill which liberated them from the factories and gave them the power to set their own wages. But such small remedies only nibble around the edges of the problem. Something more systematic had to be done and was done by 20th century presidents, especially the Roosevelts, to regulate the free market and capital, whether by child labor laws, labor safety laws, antitrust laws, and any number of other laws with the same purpose. As the government added regulation after regulation throughout the 20th century, however, it has become less clear how capitalism differs from socialism. The Communist Manifesto de demands 10 political reforms. And by my count, by the time of FDR and certainly by LBJ, at least six of them have become true of the United States. And progressives are always agitating for another, whether it's higher stimulus payments, universal basic income, universal health care, mandatory pre-K education, racial reparations, or whatever, progressives are always fighting to empower the state by giving it domain over the market and the family. The goal is always the same, at least in their conception, perfect equality. There are, of course, differences between the socialist regimes mentioned earlier and the United States of America. Those regimes were installed overnight by bloody revolutionary victory, whereas the United States, and more so other Western countries, have become socialist gradually. The terminus, however, is the same. Whether led by Brezhnev or Biden, each is a sclerotic state that achieves neither the dynamism of capitalism nor the perfect equality of socialist utopia. Instead, like the Soviet Union, our economy stagnates and the distinction between elites and everyone else becomes greater rather than smaller. Why is this? Well, whatever its propaganda, in each case, the Soviet Union and the United States, the real government, the government of apparatchiks, petty officials and informers in the Soviet case, the government of civil servants, lobbyists and activists in our own, the, this real government, the one that actually writes the regulations is not really aimed at equality, but instead at the preservation and augmentation of its own power. How else to explain the relentless growth of both the bureaucracy, but also the widening class distinctions? The academy, for its part, supplies the sophisticated theories upon which this propaganda of equality is based. The journalists weave these theories into a narrative of current events so that these elites can feel virtuous while gaining status, money, or both. In a tight loop, the government receives a fig leaf for its lust for power, while professors and journalists taste the sweet fruit of influence, either directly by consulting with government agencies or indirectly by training the entire class of elites in an ideology. This is the ideology of equality, of special rights complete with a host of shibboleths unintelligible to the proles who do not recognize those rights. But in time, they will be made to do so by judges and the policies academics legitimate, even if their representatives complain, because after all, that's the arc of history. The effect is not equality, because that's not really its goal. However self-deceived this government may be, however captured by this ideology it has become, its goal is simply power. And winning that, it is, and winning that, it is extremely effective. Look at the growth of government and the conformity of academics around ideological answers since FDR, but especially in recent years. What can be done? If nothing else, I have tried briefly to show the flaws in three systems, socialism, libertarianism, and the sclerotic, bureaucratic, academic form of capitalism that is slouching toward Marx. None of these is appealing. Might there be a fourth? If so, it would be a form of regulated capitalism whose regulators were transparent in their ends. Instead of justifying their lust for power with a hypocritical ideology of equality, they could, in the worst case, seek no justification at all, but simply admit their self-interest. Let's work with that, for if we cannot rely upon virtue to guarantee good government, we must be prepared for the worst. Imagine a government that regulated its people simply to become more powerful. A moment's reflection shows, and by more powerful, I mean so that the nation becomes more powerful, not so that the class that rules the government becomes more powerful. A moment's reflection shows that the current system is not doing that. 
consider only the COVID catastrophe, which has been accurately described as, quote, the Chernobyl of everything. The government grows ever stronger while the nation grows ever more sick, poor, and feeble. Imagine then a government that saw the nation as its property so that it would grow in power as the asset it owned becomes more valuable. This was the old model of sovereignty before the democratic revolutions conceived government as the servant of the people. In the monarchies of Europe, the government was the master of the people. By owning them, the monarch had a direct interest in making them better. Just as you take better care of a car that is your own than you do of one you rent. Such a monarch could regulate capitalism in order to make the people better, not to degrade them. Needless to say, people formed in the democratic ideology of our time are revolted by such talk. We don't want a master. The problem is, in practice, we already have one the elites and their hypocritical values. If you're revolted by something in theory that you accept in practice, maybe you deserve to be mastered. But aren't monarchs susceptible of the same corruption as socialist tyrants? Doesn't absolute power corrupt absolutely? It must be true, it's so pithy and people say it so often. Well, the scale of socialist atrocities are without parallel in history. Some new demon is unleashed from hell whenever the tyrant's legitimacy stems from his pursuit of utopia, in that case, perfect equality. I don't know any episode in history like the Holodomor or the Cultural Revolution in China, where a king deliberately caused the death of millions of his own people. Of course, kings have been brutal to other peoples, but not typically to whole swaths of their own. When kings are brutal to their own people, it is usually precise, violence against rivals, the nobles, the elite, the writers of history, the ones who would depose the king. This is why elites have always exaggerated the threat of kings and emperors. What they fear most is not mass murder. After all, socialism remains fashionable among these elites, despite the evidence of its crimes. They don't fear mass murder. What they fear is a leader who would attack or disempower them and the ideology they've carefully crafted to legitimize their rule. So in conclusion, Nero was a bad emperor. He was vain, cruel, and greedy. But when he died, the people wept. Like most of the Roman emperors, he was their champion against the senatorial class, the elites who assassinated him, not because he managed the empire badly, but because he humiliated them and threatened their prerogatives. So it is today with any champion of the people against the elites. They will say anything, the elites will. They'll believe anything. They'll do anything to thwart such a leader. Not because he's really a fascist, a master, or a tyrant, because he would, but rather because he would expose the big lie of their government, that its purpose is not to serve the people, but instead to serve themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Dr. Swindoll, if you would like to proceed with your opening statement. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was quite a, there's a lot there, Dr. Miller. Um, the, uh, can I uh, share something, screen? Sure, yeah. So I'm a co-host. You should be able to now. Okay. Um, just a couple of initial um, uh, oh, you know, I can't I can't move my screen up and down here for some reason. Okay. Everyone see that okay? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, initial remarks, uh, and then I'll be about 20 minutes as well. Um, I'd like to just to say the initial you're, you're very kind of uh, reasonable about capitalism, Dr. Miller. So that was helpful that you critiqued it as well as um, kind of you know showed its its possibilities. Um, I do have kind of a scorecard uh, of our agreements and disagreements that that will come out during Q and A. Um, I'm going to rely upon Karl Marx, and I'll I'll, I'll tell why. Uh, I think several of you will disagree with that. For good reasons, but that is 
that's what I chose to do here to try to make my case for socialism. Um, I'm not gonna give any kind of formula for a best socialism at the end. I'm, I'm just gonna show kind of conceptually uh, what, what the differences are and, and many of the virtues of socialism uh, conceptually. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm, trying, I'm going to ignore the, the atrocities that uh, Dr. Miller has more than <laughs> indicated, but I think from more of a conceptual point of view, um, I'm gonna argue that those were aberrations. Um, and you can, if you ask questions, if you use the first name Bernie, when you ask me a question, that will be fine. That was a joke. <laughs> Hey, we have to, how many times do we have a, so, a bona fide socialist as a cap, as a, a presidential candidate? Come on, you. Okay. So, my other thing here. Okay. Um, socialism. Um, okay, I grew up in Pullman, Washington, eight short miles from Moscow, Idaho, which was just across the border. I used to ride my bike to Moscow often. It's a town of about 20,000 people. One day in the 1980s, a pizzeria was opened in Moscow with the clever name of Karl Marx's Pizza. To acknowledge the fact that the city of Moscow bore the same name as the capital of the Soviet Union. Shortly thereafter, a number of citizens staged a protest to ask the city to make the pizzeria change its name because it was celebrating communism by using the name of Karl Marx for a public establishment. Though the name stuck, though the restaurant was closed for other reasons within a few years, the shame of Moscow stuck to certain people. The uh, pizzeria actually burned down in 1987, not claiming arson there. Uh, last fact about Karl Marx pizzeria was that Sarah Palin used to frequent it, we are told, when she lived in Moscow for a couple of years. Socialism has been around for a while. All forms of it have appeared throughout history, in the New Testament with the way disciples lived, certain aspect of medieval guilds, Israeli kibbutzes, and perhaps even hippie living in the 1960s. Theoretically, it came to the fore in thinkers like Saint-Simon, the creation of an industrial society, Proudhon, with his idea of work cooperatives, these are all in the 19th century, Ricardo with his labor theory of value, and Charles Fourier with his notions of feminism, these are all again 19th century, and Robert Owen with his famous experimental socialist community, some of which were in the United States. Socialism has been highly maligned, especially in the United States, for a host of reasons, most of which are I want to go through today based on myths. What are they chiefly? Well, I will list, list the myths and bring out what I take to be the facts that might undermine those myths. First, though, uh, I need to define a couple of terms. Capitalism. Capitalism comes to be in the spirit of several forms, such as industrialization, mercantilism, and Adam Smith. These are kind of the historical backgrounds of the term that, we're, that I will be using here. He, he um, Adam Smith, famously held that if left to their own devices, individuals freely and competitively will benefit society through their labor. This was the basis of his idea of the free market, guided to social benefit by the infamous invisible hand. So basically kind of a Adam Smith co concocted term, I will assume for capitalism. Socialism is applied to cases where a government that works for more economic equality in a country or even in the world as a whole Okay, so I agree with Dr. Miller on that definition. However, Marx in this case is not a socialist because Marx often talked about the problems with 
basing equality or using equality to base a society on. All right. Regardless, socialism uh, asks for a government structure that disallows both unfettered free markets and that those that oppress the working class primarily. Thus, at least initially, socialism has to use tight economic and political controls to make this freeing of the working class possible. So that's my definition of socialism. Communism, on the other hand, well, there is a form of socialism, but there are several variants of it. Um, in Marx's radical understanding of socialism and therefore of his communism, it is a society that quite literally has neither political life nor government. And that's a very important part of the definition of communism. This started as in his works as early as on the Jewish question in 1843, continues through till his famous capital itself, a critique of political economy written in 1867. For Marx, communism is not an entity that is planned and then carried out, but rather one that emerges organically for the inevitable collapse of capital and also socialism will make it necessary that communism emerge. Now, there has never been a form of communism as such, I hold, but several socialisms and Dr. Miller talked about this, have designated themselves as communism. Pol Pot, Castro, the Soviet Union, China, there are many. I would dispute a little bit the, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the designations there but that, that Dr. Miller had, but not, not, not significantly. Now to the myths. So myth number one, it's on your screen sharing here. Oh, wait, I'm showing my paper. <laughs> Just a second here. Um, I want to show just the other thing here. Sorry. Otherwise, I think it's kind of hard to follow the paper itself. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Uh, myth number one, Karl Marx aimed to eliminate capitalism out of sheer hatred for it. Now remember, Marx, I'm calling a communist form of socialism. He thus used deceptions. This is the myth. He used deceptions and falsehood to foment revolutions that would be violent and worldwide and would raise up a new cadre of leader who would be on the, quote, right side of history and bring the wealthy down and the poor up to an economical quality that would keep all workers and capitalists at the same level. That's, that's what I find in the myth. Um, by the way, the facts. I'm sorry, is this still screen sharing my actual text? Yeah, we're seeing the document that says five myths about socialism, right? Just now. the five myths, nothing else. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Okay, uh, the facts. Marx did have an extremely poor estimation of his version of capitalism. Yet he was convinced that it not only alienated workers, but also the owners of the means of production as well as he called them. Capitalism made again, not only the workers, but all laborers overwork, all laborers overwork. And that includes the, the ruling class. As a result, it overproduces goods and services, ruining the environment, while at the same time not bestowing on anyone the time to enjoy the overproduced goods that they're making. Perhaps simplistic, but indeed it has shown how socialist kinds of economic reforms, though often by government interventions, has actually worked to control overproduction and increase leisure time. And these are again, socialist kinds of reforms as Dr. Miller also pointed out. The overproduction on Marx's account though, would lead to what he would call the, quote, falling rate of profits, unquote, which would implode capitalism from within. Okay, myth number two. 
a violent overthrow of capitalism was needed and thought by most socialists to be needed to make its transition to, to the communist form of socialism. And this says it would be carried out by the proletariat primarily, principally agriculture and factory workers who were poorly paid and be assisted by migrant laborers that he called the industrial reserve army or the lumpen proletariat or even the rabble. That's the myth, the facts. If capitalism could be so easily overthrown, why hasn't it already been done? This is also often a criticism of Marxism. It's been a, a hundred and over like 170 years. Why hasn't it been overthrown yet if Marx was so good? The early 20th century saw ostensibly opportunities for this overthrow, especially from the Bolsheviks or the Chinese or other forms of, of communism that have talked about some kind of overthrow. Marx gave absolutely no timeline for, as to when this would happen. This eventual for him, not an overthrow, but just an organic dissolution of capitalism. Marx had gone through the 1848 failed revolutions in Europe without thinking that it negated his theory of the emergence of communism. But then capital, Das Kapital, does not speak of revolution at all. That's an interesting part about Marx. He really gave up on the idea of revolution by the late 1860s. Okay, myth number three. Any socialism promotes the ideal of radical equality. Okay, now earlier on, I kind of admitted that this had some relation to equality, uh, and Dr. Miller says that too. Um, however, there's a myth here. Ordinarily, this continues the idea that not only would wages in socialism be effectively equal, but also wealth. If that's the case, the myth says, well, no one would ever be able to do anything supererogatory, unusual, charitable, or even an act of genius. According to the myth, Kierkegaard gets it right. In this kind of a planned economy and radical equality, we would leave mediocre lives in an intense form of publicness where no one would be motivated to do great things in order to earn more money in the process. In socialism, no one should stand out. All right, so what are the facts? Again, I'm going to shift to Marx here. Marx actually thought that equality was undesirable as a social goal. Yes, let me repeat that. Marx actually thought that equality was undesirable as a social goal. Why? He said, like money and capital, equality is itself an abstraction. Marx was much more existential in his thinking and affirmed the value and uniqueness of individuals. Consistently then, Marx did not sing, distinguish in any way uh, genuses like race or gender in this focus on real individualism. In communism, he was convinced that each person would be a radically individual in their own labor, and that labor is the source of all dignity and all individuation of human persons. Um, so equality was not a goal for Marx. We can talk more about that as needed. Myth number four, socialists tend to be Luddites, anti-technology or anti-research, if it undermines in any way the social cohesion they're looking for. After all, just looked at what happened in the Soviet Union when Stalin collectivized the agrarian societies and also made sure that research into the humanities must depend on strict notions of historical materialism effectively undermining that research. Even physics had to so conform to Stalin's idea of historical materialism. And did not Marx himself criticize much urbanization in his early work? Yes, he did. 
Marx railed against factory workers becoming also once the industrial revolution came, he railed against them becoming appendages to machines. What are the facts though? Marx was unabashedly pro-technology. He understood that mechanization helped workers and improved the quality of their lives and dignity. The only problem was that mechanization did not help to make profits for capitalists in the long run and would actually lead to the collapse of capitalism by its overproduction. Also, machines were controlled by the owners of the means of production, who simply bought and sold the labor that operated these machines, inexorably leading to the alienation of those workers by being merely commodities. Okay, um, the last myth here. Socialism insists on an inflexible orthodoxy relatively and a relatively strict and inflexible cultural hegemony. I think I got that all right when I translated it there. So th this is just the ideology of socialism, that's a myth. Now, many of these ideologies are of course religious, um, leaning towards the overthrow of religion and atheism and all things aesthetic. We're all too familiar with the inflexible orthodoxy of fascist art, which was a, a socialism that was heavily re regulated by the government. Socialists are not considered individuals, uh, individual centric, nor allow very much for autonomy of thought and communication and expressivity. So that's basically the, the orthodoxy about uh, socialist ideology. Okay, the facts. The very idea of fascist art, for example, was an aberration. It was a means of controlling what was seen as destabilizing in art as a means of social control. A more factual view of socialism was that of Walter Benjamin, the German philosopher of the early 20th century, critical theorist. He points this out well in both his Origin of the German Tragic Drama and his famous the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. For him, technology of whatever context inspires artistic expression, such as film in film, and can lead to an increased quality to one's sense experience of the world. However, it can also make art a tool of oppression. Think of Hitler's use of film for war propaganda with Lenny Reifenstahl. Religion is a different matter. As a general rule, socialisms tend to be strongly, let's say, humanistic, with a de-emphasis on faith and religion and spirituality. But here the facts are that I don't think there's much of a difference between cultural ideologies in capitalism and cultural ideologies in socialisms, because they both have strong sense of orthodoxies and uh, inclusion and um, non-membership in this orthodoxy. We can talk about that more. Okay, my conclusion is very, very simple. At the risk of a little too much simplification, there's a basic underlying philosophy for capitalism on the one hand and socialism on the other. A, capital fa capitalism favors the individual, Socialisms favor the group or society. I'll just read that again because that's kind of my, my, this is my conclusion. Capitalism favors the individual. Socialisms favor the group or society. That's my one kind of uh, differentiation there. The second one is capitalism favors abstract and mathematical measurement of value. Socialism the concrete, communal, and to a large extent, immeasurable quality of the lives of people. And let me just repeat that again. I meant to put that on the sheet, right? apologies. Capitalism favors abstract and mathematical measurement of value. Socialism favors the concrete, communal, and to a large extent, immeasurable quality 
of the lives of people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swindoll. Uh, Dr. Miller, I don't know if you want to respond at all to that. I'd rather open it up to the audience and have us respond to questions. Since we have such a big audience today, I think that would be better. Uh, Dr. Swindoll, are you okay with that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, then I think I, the first question I saw was from uh, Jacob, if he'd like to ask his question. Yeah, can you guys hear me all right? Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Swindoll, and thanks, Dan, for, for organizing this. Uh, a lot of great points on both sides. Uh, I think one of my problems in, in trying to, you know, adjudicate between the two positions is that it doesn't seem like really there's like a central proposition that one side is arguing for and one side is arguing against. And I was wondering what you as the, as the two interlocutors see as the central theme of your two discussions and then maybe you could just have at it and even in defining what that proposition is and then your own two positions. Good. Yeah, so that we'd not talk past each other, I guess, is the invitation. Um, the way I characterize the difference is not, as is sometimes said, that socialism is state control and capitalism is private free markets and capital, because part of my paper was to say, well, free markets and capital don't last very long and they do a lot of damage. So the state usually steps in and starts regulating. And so one way of looking at my paper, at least until the few final paragraphs, is to say, well, there isn't in the end that much difference. It's a matter of degree, how much state control. But that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that although there's going to have to be state control of the economy, the question is control to achieve what goal? That's why I began to say economics is ultimately a philosophical discipline, not just because of its history, but also because its primary question is, what's the goal of political life? And I took socialism's goal to be the promotion of equality. <laughs> Dr. Swindoll has challenged that with, with myth four and he knows Marx better than I do. So I don't know that I'd be able to win on, on a debate about what Marx took the goal to be, but I take the goal of the socialists that I know and the socialist policies that I study and hear about and so on. The goal always seems to be the promotion of equality. And I argued that loosely, of course, I argued that that's uh, not a realistic goal, that, uh, that that loses demons. That's a utopic goal. And as a result, it can legitimize uh, any amount of brutality. Yeah, um, if I were to, to boil down to two, I think our points of, to make the, 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 the to more precise where there are disagreements, obviously, uh, it would be on um, yeah, this notion of equality and then on the value of abstraction. That's, that's a philosophical, I think that's my huge philosophical difference between socialism and capitalism. So Dr. Miller, we've already gone, I'll just call you Patrick. <laughs> we've already gone through, we've already gone through the um, rehearse the equality thing. And yes, it's Marx is pretty idiosyncratic on that. And yet Marx has to be the one that inspired so many socialism in whatever way they interpreted him. We, we have to acknowledge that. Uh, China right now is, sees itself as a Marxist inspired government that has 1.3 billion people are living under a regime that Marx is in their interpretation, the inspiration for. Now, does it look like they have equality? It certainly does to a Westerner. We, we see it as a kind of a mass psychology and, and a lot of social control and forcing to averageness and everyone looks the same, receives the same. Now we know it's tinged with capitalism very much now. So that's, that's gonna be a kind of hard example. But if I can make kind of the, the what, what is the philosophical case for against equality? And that is that it's a mathematical motion, as I, as I said. 
the equality doesn't exist anywhere but in our minds when we're dealing with things like numbers or other abstractions. No two people are the same. No two days are the same. No two moments are the same. Uh, no two um, feelings are the same, even in us and in other people. And for Marx, it was like we were been bewitched, probably in the you know the development of, the, of mathematical analysis and statistics, which he does talk about. His his followers talk about the problems of statistical thinking. Is it's a bewitchment that. Um, capitalism has bought. Everything in capitalism is measurable by ultimately reducing it to statistics. Um, and that, again, that's, that's the spirit he had. Um, and Horkheimer and Adorno, particularly uh, Max Horkheimer, wrote extensively on how Marx is correct about if you want to live a true, free, life, you live it without looking for equality as your basic measurement of all value. Um, so that's that's the one thing that I take to be the Marxist. Addition to socialism, and yet Marx had much to do with any socialism that emerges, even though in his name or not, is kind of funky because they do, they go all over the place and they've been very repressive often. Okay, so that's the equality. Um, uh, problem that I, I see and the abstraction or issues between us. Jacob, do you have any follow up to that, or was that did both of their responses sufficiently answer your question? No, yep, yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, Alexander Gorman, if you would like to ask your question. Sure. Um, so my question is is I guess primarily for Dr. Miller. Um, the notion that in every instance, socialist revolutions have brought tyranny, poverty, mass death, right? Um, you cited the figure of a hundred million, which is hotly contested um, and involves some sort of, some degree of, creative accounting. However, like the, the sort of broader point is, you know, has to also address like the constitutive violence of capitalism in that, you know, within the sort of development of capitalism, we've seen, you know, I just to, there's, it, it's not simply this sort of uh, project of like free and equal development, you know, based on individual capacities in a market exchange, right? It, it, it's reality is it includes the colonization of the Americas, the transatlantic slave trade, which largely constitutes the basis on which m in much of circulating capital continues to be based. I mean, in some kind of primitive sense, right? Um, the colonization of Africa, India, uh, and countries all, all over the world, right? Um, you know, and the sort of toll on human life that capitalism has accumulated is largely sort of dismissed. It's like not really something that we get an accounting of, right? Because, you know, when for every reference to the Holodomor or the Cultural Revolution, right, there's not a reference to, for example, the Bengal famine of the 1940s, uh, which was essentially like a decision made by Parliament in Britain, right, by, um, by Churchill or the, sort of slaughter of millions in the Congo, right? Um, so I guess like just to sort of uh, also on the other side of this question, right? In terms of, you know, the kind of catastrophic uh, accounting of actually existing socialisms, 
I mean, in, in no case, right, do we see the development of these revolutions in countries which are, which have already uh, undergone a kind of like democratic capitalist revolution or like development in that direction, right? In Russia, it's, a, you know, the, the background is, is a failed autocracy, which has essentially collapsed into a failed state um, with millions of deaths on that account as well. Um, prior to the revolution, and the seizure of power is taken against the threat of military dictatorship. Although it may itself be a military dictatorship, but that's another story. Um, and in China, right, the situation in 1949 when the Communist Party took power was one of almost 40 years of war, of civil war between warlords, uh, nationalists, the Japanese invasion, right, which are all brutal. So like in, in both of those cases, you have countries which are, you have revolutions against which the background is like absolute chaos and brutality in which the communist regimes come into power. And establish essentially like a, a, you know, a, you know, without without sort of apolog being apologetic, right? There is a sort of we we shouldn't engage in a kind of counter history, right? Where something that could have happened didn't. Um, what happened happened, and we sort of need to take account of that. But you know, even in sort of looking at the sort of range of socialist regimes, um, Russia, China, Vietnam, Cuba, right? Even in light of the sort of fact that these are not necessarily what I might think of when I think of socialism or what a lot of socialists, you know, that sort of no true, no true Scotsman problem. In, in all of these cases, we nonetheless see, right, uh, dramatic increase in the quality of life, although over a period, over the long term, more than immediately, you know, there's dislocation, but there's also improvements in the quality of life. There's improvements in literacy, in education. I mean, uh, Russia goes from being a, a, an extremely backwards agricultural society and a failed state in 1917 to being a, a power that rivals the greatest, you know, the greatest powers in the world in terms of technology and, and development and so forth. And China has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of, out of poverty today. Um, and is another instance where a colonized country that less than a century ago was a, a sort of fabric of warring, of, of warlords, right? Is now a great power. Um, and, you know, prior to the revolution in Cuba, it was essentially a colony of the United States, you know, extremely corrupt in every conceivable way. So I, I think that there's a, a sort of question that needs to be posed of, well, on the one hand, um, you know, what is capitalism's toll, right? Especially now as we, we stand looking at, you know, this sort of catastrophic global climate situation. Um, yeah, well, I mean, what is capitalism's toll? Taking into account that it's not this abstract system, it's a concrete system that includes, right, um, imperialism and, and colonization and subjugation and slavery and genocide. Um, and then on the other hand, like why not take into account the developmental achievements of some of these socialist 
nations, which prior to their revolutions were either colonial, um, either subject to like colonial rule or autocracy or warlord, you know, fragmentation. Um, yeah. Okay, well, there's a lot in there. I won't be able to respond to it all, and I wouldn't be able to respond to it all, but I'll take out the things that I am able to respond to. Uh, I think the first is, well, about the death toll. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter whether it's 100 million or 80 million or 75 million. It's very high. And the difference, it seems to me, between the death toll one would attribute to capitalism versus the one would one should attribute to socialism is that if one attributes to capitalism the deaths... Uh, of slaves in the transatlantic uh, trade or the genocide of the American Indian population and so on, those would not be deaths to the population of the country that's doing them. In other words, what I wanna say is countries do bad things to other countries all the time, whether they're socialists or capitalists. So I think we just kind of have to wipe that off the ledger and look instead at the brutality that regimes do to their own people. And I don't see anything in history to compare to the Holodomor, the Cultural Revolution, or for that matter, the Great Leap Forward. So I was thinking about the other point I want to make is the way in which communist nations advanced uh, after their revolutions. And people tend to forget the Great Leap Forward of the 1950s when Mao really had just seized power and wanted to make that Great Leap Forward in, into advancement. That was... Uh, <laughs> That was again a, a genocide of sort, I mean, in the sense of a mass murder that uh, didn't in fact advance China technologically and yet killed millions and millions of people. So that I think that the advances of the Chinese economy happened ironically after 1979 with Deng Xiaoping rather than with Mao. It seems like Mao, China's obviously a, a nation of a great history and, and had always had a great potential even in the 19th century and it was bound to advance to become one of the world leaders that it's become now, but that Mao did more to hold it back than he did to advance it. I would say the same for Stalin as well. I mean, I, I, I tend to see those events as being sort of on an equal footing with the sort of transition to capitalism in the Americas, in Britain, in the colonized world. Um, where you have a sort of the establishment of an industrial system which takes you know which involves great dislocation and brutality right which isn't yeah um but i mean i guess that's sort of the the question is like whether capitalism actually lives up to its own claims about itself of being you know a sort of yeah uh less than violent in its <laughs> um practice. Oh, well, I don't think capitalism claim, I don't, I mean, the conception of capitalism that I put forward in my talk didn't make any claims about it being inherently nonviolent or anything like that. I mean, insofar as the state gets involved, there has to be violence. That's how, that's how police forces and armies work. Um, but the, the distinction I want to draw is that the violence of capitalist countries is not directed at its own people in the way that socialist countries direct violence at their own people not even so much because of equality as the goal, although I think there are special problems there, but because they're utopic. I think utopic regimes inherently direct violence against their own people in order to purify their people for whatever their goal is. And I think equality is a goal that lends itself especially to that kind of purification because the moment people are rising above equality, then they deserve to be expropriated and in some cases assassinated. Just to say that uh... Marx thinks that capitalism is a form of utopic thinking par excellence because it based the entire basis of uh, uh, interactions, particularly of labor, upon abstractions, and that's utopic, which is wealth, money. Um, that's a form of idealism, as Marx would use the term, which is a form of utopic thinking. Now, not in a political form of a new kind of society, but it's the same basic evil of basing one's life upon abstractions that don't have concrete uh, realities like any utopia. 
I mean, ironically, I find that a very abstract criticism. So I'm, can you make it concrete for me? If well, I want government, to- We're talking about forms of government, right? Or economics. We have, these are models and theories. Capitalism is a model, socialism is a model. We're talking about some kind of internal consistency of that. We know that whatever we do in everyday life, it's not gonna map out exactly what we're thinking, but they, these are models we're talking about. Same with Plato. Plato was talking about models, right? Of democracy and theory and so on. So on their own internal consistency, I'm just distilling out what are the presuppositions that differ between these two models of economic or political life. Yeah. But uh, can tell me in, in a concrete instance what the difference would be. So if I'm Elon Musk in the United States, and I have this great idea for a new kind of car or for space exploration, in the United States, in a, a nominally capitalist country, I can go and petition capitalists to lend me the money, and I promise to pay them back at interest so that I can bring this idea into reality, build factories, hire workers, et cetera. In the Soviet Union or in China, in the flourishing periods of the communist economies, that's not possible. And I, so that doesn't seem abstract to me at all. Elon Musk doesn't have to have utopic thoughts to do all that? Well, he has dreams. I mean, anybody who wants to bring an idea into reality is a dream, but I don't, that's not a critique of capitalism. That's a critique of dreamers that I don't, I don't see the force of. But, but isn't the critique that Marx develops that, you know, the sort of ideals of liberty, equality, and Bentham mask the reality, right, which is expropriation, dispossession, immiseration, and, and you know, at minimum, exploitation. Yeah. Like, like, like it's like only developed capitalism operates just strictly on exploitation, right? Because these other, like it's in its process of development, it is based in dispossession, enslavement, right? Like just the, the imposition of like like of laws that that moved people off of lands that they had inhabited for centuries and had you know essentially customary rights over and that's not in the united states that's in britain so should we take another question sure robbie it looks like robbie had a question so this is kind of the uh, two kind of one. So this is kind of like in reference to Dr. Miller making a reference to like stuff they like classified in elites or whatever. But a thing that I kind of I kind of thought is that like a wouldn't like like the owners of like major corporations like say Jeff Bezos and Amazon or like Walton Walton or the uh, Walton family from uh, that well the family that owns like Walmart account is among the elites, like, it feels kind of weird to put like capitalism as this equalizer of like of classes when in some ways it can actually, it kind of gives us the power, it kind of gives certain people a rise to power, like, like, like the Koch brothers or stuff of that. So I wanna say yes, if what you mean is in capitalism, some people get rich and other people don't. I mean, I think a part of it is just kind of like, how like those corporations also have influence in politics and stuff like, like, like back, I think, like say the Coke sample have like have their hands in certain politics, like their funders, stuff like Fox News. Like, I guess I'm just trying to ask like, where does the line stop where capitalism and government intersect? Like, will that kind of create conflicts of interest? Yes, so, um... Uh, I mean, one thing that I want to say to Alex is that a lot of the criticisms that he was making of capitalism were criticisms that I was making as well, not all of them exactly, but I was making those types of criticisms when I was criticizing libertarianism, namely unregulated capitalism, those kinds of horrible things can happen. Uh, similarly, with some of the examples that you're describing, uh, one thing that the Koch brothers want is a more libertarian government where they can degrade the environment, for example, uh, without environmental regulations. So yes, but another form of capitalism that I was also criticizing was something I called the sclerotic bureaucratic academic 
style of capital, capitalism where there are regulations. In fact, there are many regulations, every generation, multiple more and more regulations, but that power is achieved in that case less by direct capitalist action than by lobbying the government to get the right regulations. And of course, it can't be a naked, uh, I'm a Koch brother and I wanna build this pipeline, so I'm just gonna pay a congressman you know, a million dollars to go out to lunch so that he'll vote for it. It has to be subtler than that. They pay the lobbyists and the lobbyists write the legislation. And uh, in some cases, they agree with the activists and the academics uh, you know, develop ideologies to warrant the speeches that the representatives gives and so on. That's the elite class that I was describing there, not just rich people, but uh, basically a government. Because when we think of government, we think, well, who are the representatives? Who's the president? Who are the judges? You know, look at the constitution. The American government has metastasized, certainly since FDR, but certainly since the Civil War as well, but most of all since FDR. So it's a much bigger and diffuse thing than it is when you just read the constitution. So that lobbyists and activists and academics have quite a bit of power, even though they're not in the constitution. Obviously political parties have a giant amount of power, even though they're not in the constitution. That's the elite class that I'm talking about. So I don't know that I'm answering your question, but you could certainly, now that I've clarified okay. my position, I, let me just summarize. I spelled out three types of capitalism, libertarian capitalism, I criticized. Sclerotic bureau bureaucratic academic capitalism, I criticized. And then I said, well, look, is there any good form that can be defended after all, since I think socialism is even worse than those two other forms. And, and this was monarchical capitalism. Okay. Um, if we could go back to Elon Musk for a second here. Sure. Okay. So the capitalist can um, dream his or her dreams and form a utopic vision. And if a masses uh, a, a significant amount of money, capital, can do pretty much whatever he or she wants, uh, short of regulations uh, that are put into the capitalist system. Now that, that sets a real thing apart from the, the spirit of socialism. The spirit of socialism is that whatever one person wants to do and use abstractions to do it, who's, who's to say that the, the community will benefit from it? In the short run, jobs we created. In the long run, there was no shared investment in, in the goal of Elon Musk doing that, right? Uh, in principle. Yes. In principle. Yes. I clarify that the, the, the more utopic allowance for Elon Musk to do whatever he can afford to do. Yeah. Is, I think you're and one, this is a small but important thing I was going to mention. Just one little thing. Where do you see the term democratic most applied to? Democratic capitalisms or democratic socialisms? I'll leave that as my what I'm getting into here. Where are you going to find true democracies? You'll find it in spirit with a socialism. <laughs> Except that all the all of those states were one party states. I, and I, I didn't have yeah. as a premise in my paper anything about democracy. In the end, I come out at the, at the end of the paper as against democracy. I think democracy and capitalism is a witch's brew. Okay. I think you need a monarch to regulate capitalism. Otherwise, it degenerates into either the libertarian form that Alexander was yeah. criticizing or perhaps the sclerotic version that uh, Robert was criticizing. I think you're equivocating on utopia, though, because uh, Elon Musk has a dream. Uh, Mozart has a dream and he writes it down as the 40th symphony. Elon Musk has a dream of a, of a rocket ship and he builds a rocket ship. That's not utopic. U utopia is having a dream about how society should be constituted and taking extreme measures to get to that. And socialism does that and capitalism doesn't. That seems to me a fundamental difference between them. Well, the only way would be um, what's, what's unusual, I got that. What's unusual about socialism is, again, I'm in the Marxist framework here. Socialism is just a, a meaty, it's a middle stage between capitalism and communism. So it's gonna have, by its very nature, mixtures of both. That's why it's a hard, that's why I, I just went on Marxist side because I think he's more coherent about what socialism is. It's a halfway point. 
And yeah. there's never been a communism. So Marx has the advantage of nobody able to, to criticize his, his ultimate, now you would say, Pat, Patrick, uh, utopic view, which I would have to admit, yes, it's in that sense, it's rather utopic, but it's a theoretical one that is aware of the problems of theory. That's the difference that I see. Um, Ely, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, so I wrote it down. Uh, how would you respond to this statement? Uh, different people or people as individuals or families require different amounts of money to live happily. And that goes to either uh, either side. I'll just start with the critique of the Gupta program by Marx. From each according to his ability to each according to his needs. I would say yes to the statement. I mean, some people have 10 kids and some people have no kids. The people with 10 kids need more money. Um, my follow-up to that um, would be, uh, would socialism or capitalism be able to fulfill the statement? Um, and I, I, I don't know. I'm guessing uh, both would be a yes, but in different ways, so. What do you mean by fulfill the statement? So let's say um, a family with 10 kids needs, we'll just pull a figure out, 100,000 to be happy or at least to be secure. Whereas somebody with no kids can manage with say 25,000 or 30,000 at a minimal uh, well, cost. Even, even somebody who has a certain dream for his life but only has one kid or has no kids could need the same amount of money that a family with 10 kids that kind of idea. Right. I wasn't, I wasn't saying, you know, the kids is the only way to think about that. I'm right. just saying, you ask me a straightforward question. Do some people need more money? And I would, to be happy. And I would say, yes, here's a clear example. Somebody who has a lot more kids than somebody else needs more money to be happy because if the kids starve, the, the person's not going to be happy. But I didn't understand the follow-up question, which is, is it? Yeah. Um, which, I guess, I, I guess how would uh, capitalism or I guess how instead of would, how would capitalism um, or socialism uh, be able to fulfill this statement? I mean, it's kind of open-ended, but. That's the part I didn't understand. Fulfill the statement, like make it yeah. so that everybody who has their needs can be satisfied. Is that is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah, well, socialism, as I understand it, makes that promise, namely everyone according to their need, as, as Dr. Swindoll said, everyone according to their need will get what they need. And capitalism doesn't make that promise. And that seems harsh, like, oh my God, somebody with 10 kids has to make it by on 25,000. And, and that, that gives an emotional argument for socialism that uh, I think crashes on when the reality of what kind of governmental bureaucracy and tyranny you have to create to make it possible for everyone to get according to their needs. Yeah, to my understanding, I, I thought capitalism could also fulfill it. But um, in, in my opinion, it would probably take a, a mixture of both capitalism and socialism. Um, so and it would take probably a lot of cultural study and not just economics. So that's pretty reasonable that it would take parts of both, which is kind of what we're all facing is that there's no pure capitalism, there's no pure socialism, right. and there's no communism. But um, yeah, but then there's comparative advantages, I guess we look at. Um, what's interesting is that um, one, of the, one of the more amazing human rights that's pretty much across the world is the freedom to have children. It's, it's so interesting that it's, for the most part, uh, a freedom that we have to create more who are going to have needs, but also in capitalism would say, but more who are future laborers, future people who can keep profits going, which is essential to capitalism, according to Marx. Without the need for profit, there is no capitalism. The profits are unstable because over time, competition is 
continually pushing down the rate of profit. And that's what's going to implode capitalism. So we need children in capitalism, even though their needs when they come in, but we hope that they're going to start creating profits on the other end. Now, what's curious is that a socialist country, which I think we can call it China, uh, restricted uh, population growth. Now, everyone can kind of see why because of the overcrowding, overpopulation. So that's, I'm just saying that's a unique thing. And it's kind of interesting how most governments are pretty balanced about the freedom to have children for whatever economic or political reasons that they have. It, you don't have to, you have to do all sorts of things uh, to adopt a child legally, but to have a child, anyone in the United States, you don't have to sit, fill out a single form. <laughs> it's astonishing actually. Uh, and yet, what does that exactly mean? It's kind of interesting that that, that need creation, that, that every, we all need need creations because we, without needs, there's no labor. Um, so um, anyway. Uh, so it looks like we have a second question from Jacob. Yeah, thank you. Um, this might in some way be a follow-up from the uh, previous question, but um, Pat, you explicitly mentioned the coronavirus pandemic. And I'm hoping that both you and Jim can maybe expand on that and give an account of how, say, more socialistic policies or more uh, uh, capitalistic policies could address the, the kind of lingering economic uncertainty that's happening both you know, in our own personal lives and on the level of, of large scale governance. And I'm specifically thinking about how, you know, in, um, in some states and in some cities, uh, the governments, uh, uh, whether local governments or on, uh, uh, on the state government side, uh, they put restrictions on businesses to operate fully, whether it's restaurants, uh, having limited seating, um, or other kinds of businesses being told that you can't open at all. Um, and then when all of these businesses begin to struggle, uh, workers are put out of their jobs, then the government is starting to step in and say, well, now we're gonna uh, expand the social net, uh, social safety net, we're gonna uh, put forth more um, uh, you know, raise the minimum wage, we're going to send out another round of stimulus bills, we're going to pass this $2 trillion stimulus package. And so there seems to be a tension between some states in the union uh, restricting, uh, 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 you know, the free market, and then hoping that these stimulus, you know, uh, injections are going to fix it, but there's no real certainty that's, that's going to happen, right? This is all just like one example. And so I'm hoping that I'm, I'm pointing out some sort of tension between capitalism and socialism that maybe either of you two could address. Yeah, well, there's a, lo there's a lot to say about the coronavirus pandemic. I'm not sure I'm gonna to touch on your precise point, but if, if I don't, well, Jim will give his answer and then you can come back. Um, for me, the coronavirus pandemic politically, I'm less interested in the capitalism socialism difference than in the authoritarianism uh, of China versus what we have. Because China, because of its authoritarian government, handled the eruption of the virus at the very beginning for the first two months very, very badly by hiding it as they had done with natural disasters and so on, because that's a fragile authoritarian, as re authoritarian regimes always are. It's somewhat fragile. It has to lie. It has to deceive the population. It needs propaganda and so on. But then once it admitted it, it did everything it could to solve that problem. I mean, I, I'm not a student of their precise policies, but they got it under control very quickly. And then ironically, citizens were free to live the lives that they'd been living before once they got it under control. We, by contrast, and here I don't wanna say they're authoritarian and we're libertarian free. I don't think we live in a libertarian free society. I think that's an illusion. I think we live in this sclerotic, bureaucratic, academic regime that I described in, in my talk. Because it's scler sclerotic and it's based on processes and so on, agencies that have their rules, it can't deal with novel events 
And it was just amazing to see the unrolling disaster after disaster of decisions and decisions not made and so on. And people want to blame Trump. And of course, he's to some, to some extent to blame, but it was actually the system that was more to blame than, than Trump's particular decisions. I mean, Canada went through a, a similar thing, not quite as bad as us, but still pretty bad. So it's something about our form of government that just is rigid. It can't adapt to circumstances. And you know, I folded that into my talk about capitalism because I think that because capitalism in its unregulated libertarian version is impossible, it has to have regulations. And because of our pretense of being a democracy, our regulations become processes by which agencies must uh, accord, rules that they must follow and so on, usually uh, written, as I say, by lobbyists and activists and warranted by the expertise uh, of academics. Yeah, um, I, I agree with the academic side there, yes, too. Uh, Jacob, that's an excellent question. Again, we could go on, all of us here, for, for quite a while on that. but. Let me just say this, um, I have only been uh, increased in my faith in Marx by what's happening on the coronavirus front, particularly with the way money is being handled now. Now it's not just the coronavirus, but it is accentuated in fact. We used to think that all money was based on the gold standard, right? Well, first, before that gold was, or money was things like salt, things that were actually useful that became means of exchange. Then it became gold standard. We were on that for years. People strongly opposed going off the gold standard because all of a sudden I it do. shows more and more the abstract nature yeah. of money. And the, you know, it's like, okay, what if everyone one day decided there's not going to be any more money? Everything that's on a printout showing my bank accounts, it's not backed by anything. Well, that's what Marx understood. Marx had seen the transition from gold to uh, 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 values that were determined in market, like stock markets and so forth. He understood the empirics that showed how, how fragile money is because it's all based simply on nothing real or concrete. It's all our projections, our desires. We've seen this radically. The, when I heard that there was the first stimulus was gonna be $1.5 trillion, I thought that's impossible. I grew up when I was, you know, Bill Clinton, all he was on was a balanced budget. Every single dollar the federal government had to be <laughs> backed up by, obviously these were, were um, uh, sold as uh, uh, interest bearing support for these. That's gone. In our own lifetime, my lifetime and your lifetime too, we've seen that the understanding money is completely changing. You can, people who take out loans are the people who are smart these days. People that bet on the future, unlike people who used to have to have every single dollar ready and there before they would spend it. Now, money is even more abstract than it's ever been. How can the government possibly have spent $5 trillion or whatever it's been on, on the uh, virus? That's incredible. And to me, that's what Marx caught on to. And that someday it's, not, it's gonna be stretched, he thought, to a limit. Someday yeah. money is gonna go away. Yeah. Okay, because someone's going to either figure it out or not that. it's going to implode. But think of how the whole idea of markets is shifting so radically. Stock markets have doubled since Trump became president. How is that possible? Are we working harder? Are we better people? Are we more imaginative? What is the nature of money? So, yes, uh, we're getting away from Jacob's question about the coronavirus. So that's fine. Maybe we'll come back to it. But this is a, a crucial question, I think for this debate, the nature of money. And I agree with you that Marx foresaw this abstraction of money, but that the prophecy wasn't fulfilled until it came off the gold standard, because then you got a truly fiat currency, a currency that in this case, when you have a bill that's $2 trillion, that doesn't mean you need to raise $2 trillion in revenue by raising taxes, because then we'd all be screaming. Instead, you just print $2 trillion more trillion. But what printing $2 trillion more trillion does is it's robbing everybody who already has dollars of some fraction of the value of the dollars that they have. That's unsustainable. And you're right, that's been going on for at least a generation, arguably since the gold standard. And eventually, as I took you to hint Marx saw, it's gonna collapse, it's an illusion. And just to give some substance to what I said in my talk, one of the things that academics do, in this case, economists, 
is they participate in that illusion by treating this as a sane economy, when in fact it's insane. We're operating with this purely abstract signifier of value, which whenever we need some more of it, we just print more of it. And so long as we all believe in this illusion, it can last for a while until, for example, nobody invests in the American dollar anymore, and then the system collapses. I mean, when the Chinese decide, hey, you've printed so much of that junk, it's not worth anything anymore. We're, we're, we're selling our T-bills now, and, and we're going to invest in Bitcoin. Then we're done. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that you know, somebody, well, that's the kind of thing that needs to be regulated, definitely. But clearly, our system is not capable of regulating it, because the so-called experts who are supposed to look at the system and criticize it, like the economists in this case, are participating in it. Right. But that's why I liked your, your ending there with the academics and last, last time you responded, Patrick, is that they, somebody has to figure it out. Um, can the democracy itself do it? I don't think so. Can the people themselves? No, it's a technical, these are technical questions. Yes, yeah. kind of, and that's what's so alarming. frustrating. It's alarming to me how we got to realize what we're doing with um, the way that we finance things so so dramatically now, and the way to to really be get by in society is not by working hard; it's working hard somewhat, but also to figure out where where to borrow. <laughs> the people who know how to borrow and continually borrow are the people who are going to be wealthier. So we are at six. I don't know if you both would like to continue uh, and keep taking questions. Maybe till 6.15. Okay. Um, it looks like Patrick Weller has the next question. Oh, good. Hello, Patrick. Hi. Uh, thank you uh, both for your time. Uh, I don't know uh, Marx as well as I should, so hopefully my, my question is still uh, on target here. Uh, uh, the way I approach this is about, for me, it really just comes down to power and greed. It seems like, you know, how do you restrict or control that? That whether it's a socialist system or a capitalist system, if the government has too much power or if capitalists have too much power, it becomes problematic for people. And I also think it's interesting because I don't know if either one is even capable of doing that. And uh, it, for, for my for where that leads me to is again because i don't know marx as well as i should i thought it was interesting when you said labor is the source of all dignity and individuation because i, I could see how that connects to you know the the idea like for me is the, the the counter to that would be you know whether you're religious atheistic or agnostic you gain your dignity through that structure you could say like even, even a belief system that's through identifying with a no self, you know, through, through lack of self-identification, you, you, it's almost like a method to access a source of dignity. And, and if you could look at, you know, he's saying, I, I think if I understand it right, labor is a method to access that source of dignity when done properly in, in his sense. Yes. So you can almost say like, for, I was looking for a dichotomy kind of similar to Jacob. And, and what I got to was, you know, for the socialists, it's like economic power is to potentially enable leisure time, whereas capitalists, it's economic power to potentially fulfill dreams. And so what I wanted to try to do was problematize that. So by, by thinking of an extremely, I mean, not extremely, it's actually very common, but an atypical source of dignity, an atypical source of meaning. And say I was the kind of person that found personal meaning through my own self-destruction. I wanted to live a life that was self-destructive, not harming anybody else, but I gained dignity through that because of a, a twisted worldview that I had. How, how does that, would, would either system allow that, encourage that, or, or not allow it. You know, I, I'd say that's probably the three that you could do, allow it, disallow it, or encourage it. And I, I'm just, you know, like I said, I, I'm not versed on this topic very well, but that's the, the question I came up with. 
Okay, uh, Patrick, yeah. Uh, first of all, the power and greed thing, um, it's kind of surprising. Again, not to always go back to Marx, but at least um, you, you did note that Marx would be involved here. Those are moral claims. Uh, to say someone's greedy is a moral claim. It's not really an economic claim, certainly for Marx. So that um, for him, it's very simple. You, you're, the only kind of quasi-moral thing he deals with is labor. And he doesn't distinguish between the labor of superintendents, he calls it, that's the English translation, which means the capitalist who has to go out and make sure that the paychecks are gonna be paid and has to borrow in order to pay the paychecks of the workers and so forth. That labor of superintendents is uh, valued uh, just as much as the, the labor of people at the machines in the factory. So to, to call the capitalist greedy is not really gonna be part of Mark. In his early works, he does talk a little bit about that. But in Capital, there's not a moral claim on distinctions between labor and laborers and, and capitalists in that sense. Both have to work and both have to work hard. It looks like the capitalist is ignoring the laborers, but indirectly, he has to be able to be making profits to keep the whole thing going. So, which is kind of simplistic, but that's the way it goes. So all I'm saying is that it's interesting that Marx doesn't use moral terms very much, when, uh, except in his very early works like uh, on the Jewish question. Um, I, I, you know, about the, about the atypical meanings, that, that's a that's a really um, that's a good critical thing to put in there because I think in both systems, capitalism and socialism, you have to have fairly basic, unquestioned assumptions that you can work on about how people see their lives as meaningful, and that can be because of the uh, you know the, the social interactions of people. There is no no man is an island. You know, even if I think I'm not harming anybody with my uh, atypical meaning of my life. Well, I probably am harming somebody, you know, somebody, some way, shape or form, even if I think I'm not harming anyone. So I would agree though, that putting a, a labor theory of value is something that, that again, most socialisms pay lip service to some way, shape or form. And I would think though, that your, your basic question there about having alternative kind of uh, postulates of what a meaningful life is, is a legitimate way to criticize both capitalism and socialism. Yeah, I have a hard time answering that question um, for two reasons. One is because I would need to know the concrete example you have in mind of a self-destructive behavior. The, the one I'm thinking of is, let's say, joining the military where you're, you're putting your life at risk. So I'll just use that. You can come back. Well, the, the, I, I, would, I would just, let's say, you know, addictive drug use. Okay. You know? All right. Addictive drug use. So um, the other reason I had a hard time coming up with a simple answer is that I, I proposed three versions of capitalism. So I'll just do the addictive drug use on, on the three versions. On the libertarian version, no objection, because any, if you got the money and there's a market and there's a seller and there's the drug, then there's no judgment or, you know, moral criterion whatsoever. On the monarchical version that I gave at the end, this would depend on the monarch's view of the, the best state and the good life, because what he's trying to do is to enhance the values of his asset. He owns the country. And so having a country of addicts is, is clearly a devaluation of the asset. So he's got an interest in eliminating drugs from the society so that he can improve the, the value of his asset. The second is more complicated, the one that we actually live in, the sclerotic, bureaucratic, academic version because of its hypocrisy. <laughs> on, on one hand, its official ideology is democratic equality. On the other hand, its reality is it's just it's it's a class of people, the elite class that's just trying to promote their own interests. So you'd probably get um, a perverse drug policy in, in a situation like that, rather like the policy that we have in this country, where it's got one official rationale, and then it's got a real purpose. So for example, the elite class uh, is in some ways helped by having an underclass who's addicted to drugs because 
the way elites have always functioned is that they have a client class among the, the poor who they can organize into gangs, for example, and unleash uh, against their opponents in street violence. So it would make sense that in the kind of government that we have, this kind of sclerotic bureaucratic capitalist system, you'd have this official view that drugs are bad, but then you'd have uh, insane, incoherent drug policies that allow inner cities to fill with uh, these drugs so that a client class is created. Uh, actually, thank you both. That, that was good answers from both of you. Thank you. I'm sorry I, I took up the time there. Oh, no, thank you, Patrick. I know, thank That was a good question. Yes, question. Speaking of which, that's it's about 6.15. <laughs> and I, I could do it all night, but I, I have plans for the evening, so. Sure. Well, thank you to both uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Swindoll for participating in this debate and to everybody who came out to watch it and uh, ask questions. Um, I also want to say uh, we're going to discuss uh, this topic tomorrow in our regular meeting. So if you all, okay. if there are people here who didn't get a chance to talk or maybe want to argue uh, in, in a dirtier fashion than uh, it was <laughs> <laughs> today, which was quite civil as always, um, then be sure to come out tomorrow uh, to our meeting, which will be at 7 uh, p.m. You can once again uh, click the or I'll send a link right now in the chat um, that people can click to join then. So uh, can I just say a word? So this is the last of the debates for this year. We don't have another one organized and the semester is coming to a close. So I think I'm confident saying this is the last one. And I just wanna thank Dan for organizing them and thank Jim for participating in, in several of them. And- um, Thank you for organizing them. Yeah, well, the little that I did, sure. And then yeah. the- um, those of you who are seniors, um, whom I've met in my classes or even just in this club, um, you know, I'll miss you. <laughs> if this is the last time that I see you, it's always sad to see senior philosophy majors disappear. You know, your, your, your absence will be felt next year when, yeah. and when and if this kind of thing reconvenes. Because frankly, without a group as solid as the DUPS has been in the last two years, it's not even clear that this kind of thing can be maintained. With that in mind, do what you can to make sure there's continuity between this year and next year. Have a new president, have a plan for when you're gonna meet in the fall so that you know the ball keeps rolling. Cause you've got it rolling now. Getting it rolling is the hardest part. Keeping it rolling is easier. Yeah. And Dan, you had, Dan, you had a lot to do with this. So I really yeah. appreciate you. And Ely, you, you were the guy that brought this to where it is today. It was two or three years ago, you kept it going. So thank you. And hello to all the graduate students as well. So glad yeah, to good to see you all. All right, all right, good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. All right, thank you.